Well, welcome to Vision Sunday. You may be seated, and I'm going to pray for us as we get into this exciting day. I'll tell you where we're going from here. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your worthiness, for the way, God, that you have moved so mightily in our midst, and the way, God, Father, that you are, have saved our souls in a way that we don't deserve. And we thank you for your son, we thank you for salvation in him, and we thank you for your word. And God, we know that this church would have no reason to exist if it wasn't for your fatherly love towards us, so much so that you would give your son to die for us, that we would have reason to say you are worthy. So we come to you today to say you are worthy. Above all things, we enter your house with praise, saying you are worthy. You are worthy of all of our praise. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. Be celebrated now as we look at your word and look at the accomplishments of your hand. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, I wanna take you to the lowest point on earth. I quite literally wish I could put you on a plane and take you there. It's located in Israel, the southern part of Israel. It's the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on the globe. If you were to look at our globe like a golf ball, it's the biggest dent, it's the furthest down place, 1,412 feet below sea level. It's an incredible place, a place located at the bottom of Israel where all of the water that flows from Mount Hermon through the Jordan River finally ends up into the Dead Sea. Fresh water flows in, but no water flows out. The salt content is so high that you can step into the water and eventually be swept off of your feet because you are so buoyant and you cannot sink. In some ways, it's kind of a gross place. The mud is gross and the water is gross, yet it has this significance and this history to it that is beautiful. Not far from the Dead Sea, the the, the start of the Dead Sea at the end of the Jordan is a small little Palestinian village called Jericho. Jericho has been around, archeologists say, for some 3,500 years or longer. It was a city of about 40,000 people there located on what would be the west side of the Jordan, the opposite side of the Jordan where all of the Israelites once camped out some 3,500 years ago. Israel was a people group freed from Egypt captivity and were hoping someday to enter into the promised land, the very place that God had promised to them. They were waiting for it, so they called it the promised land, but their ancestors grumbled against God and all of his faithfulness and weren't allowed to enter. Their parents, their grandparents were kept at bay until finally Moses passed away. Many of the older generation had passed away and it was time for the gates of the promised land to be opened only by the hand of God. Joshua was their fearless leader, certainly grieving the loss of Moses, his grandfather, father figure, his his mentor figure in his life. He, He loved Moses, but now God is saying, you're the man, and there encamped not far from the Dead Sea on the other side of the Jordan, he is realizing to take over the promised land, it's gonna take the sovereignty of God to win battles against cities like that of Jericho. Jericho was fortified, large walls, 40,000 people, but a mighty army on the inside. And so Joshua goes against the city and he fights to win the city, not with sword, not with some indestructible strategy, not with unbelievable power and might. He, He fights against the city with trumpets, musical instruments. You'll remember, it's one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible. Joshua goes to take over Jericho, and he's fulfilling the seemingly ridiculous command of God to march around the city six times playing instruments, and on the seventh day, do it seven times, and then the walls will crumble. Can you imagine what that had to be like for him as a leader to stand in front of the people and to say, listen, we're going to take this mighty city, but put your swords down, leave your weapons at home, pull out that old bugle that trumpet, that instrument, and and come with me because we're going to follow the command of God. God really called them to be faithful. That's what he called them to do. He said, listen, I have a way for you to conquer a city, but it's it's going to require your faithfulness. And not only will it require your faithfulness, but it will require you to remember that I have been faithful to you. You see, behind the story of Joshua chapter 6 is an incredible lineage, storyline of God's faithfulness to them. 
Yes, they were faithful to obey the commands of God, but God had been so faithful to them. Let's rewind the tapes just to Joshua chapter three for a second. And in Joshua chapter three, as they're on the other side of the Jordan, they see the Dead Sea in the, in the, in, on the horizon. They see the Jordan across them, which at that time would have had raging waters. And, and they would have known that to get to the promised land, we have to get across this. And maybe fear was gripping them. Yet Joshua said, listen, it's time. We're gonna go. And then in verse 10 of chapter three, he says, do not forget that the living God is among you. They had to be asking questions. Josh, how are we going to get across the Jordan River? How are we going to get all these people and all these crops and all of our nursery supplies and packing plays and cooking equipment? How are we going to get it all across the Jordan? This isn't going to work. And all he says to them is, the living God is among you. In fact, in Joshua chapter 3, I think he has to pull up his bootstraps and say to them, listen, I'm now your leader. Moses is gone, but God will guide us. Trust me. He called for them to trust. And we see from Joshua chapter 3 all the way to Joshua chapter 24, finally the people were growing in their trust of Joshua, but not just Joshua as their leader, the God that was behind Joshua, the living God that was in their midst. And so Joshua said, just trust me. We're going to go over. We're going to get to the other side. And I'm sure as a leader, he had to be scratching his head going, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to go. And we might lose a whole bunch walk as they drift down the Jordan River into the Dead Sea, but we're going to at least make an attempt at it. Trusting the faithfulness of God and acting in faith himself, they set foot into the Jordan River, and God did what he had done before. The waters stopped, and they walked across on dry land. Like a massive dam held by the hand of God, the Bible explains that the waters were backing up so it was overflowing the brim of the Jordan like it does at harvest time. The waters stopped and they walked across on dry land. You would have thought that when they encountered Jericho in chapter six, they would have no fear knowing that God could stop the waters of the Jordan. He can certainly overcome a city with trumpets. In fact, maybe that's exactly it. Maybe because they had seen God's faithfulness prior, they now could trust him as they tried to conquer this city. When they got to the other side of the Jordan, they didn't just pull out the barbecues and the cornhole games. They didn't just start celebrating that they got across the Jordan. In fact, in Joshua chapter four, Joshua gives them a very clear command that, listen, we need to remember the faithfulness of God. And I say to you this morning, for the first part of our Vision Sunday, we are going to remember God's faithfulness. Before we celebrate, before we move on and talk about vision and where we're going, we must remember God's faithfulness. That's exactly what Joshua did on the west side of the Jordan. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look at a passage with me in Joshua chapter four, verses four through seven. It's a powerful passage about remembering the faithfulness of God. The waters had been split. Joshua calls together people from every tribe. And you can follow along with me on page 180 if you'd like to, and the Bible's in front of you. He calls together people from every tribe. The 12 tribes of Israel were all there, safe on the other side. Nobody had lost anything. No people had been lost. No livestock had been lost. They all made it across safely. And Joshua says, I want you to take a stone, a stone from the river, one of the stones that we stepped across on. I want you to take one of those stones. I want you to place it in your camp overnight. And may it be a symbol in your camp of God's faithfulness. And meet me back here the next morning. And then the next morning, he calls the men together with their 12 stones. And we pick up in verse four. It says, Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign to you. A sign of what? A sign of God's faithfulness. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. 
And the people of Israel did just as Joshua had commanded and took up the 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And then Joshua set up the 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the covenant had stood. And they, were, they are there till this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. What did they do? They remembered the faithfulness of God. Faithfulness in us starts by remembering the faithfulness of God. Listen to me, if you're in a place of discouragement, you're like, I don't know how to get over the Jordan that's in my life. I have an insurmountable task that I'm trying to overcome. Maybe the place you need to start is going back to where you know God has been faithful to you and recounting his faithfulness. The Bible tells us time and again, with thanksgiving in your hearts, recount the worthiness, recount the faithfulness of God. That's exactly what Joshua did. Just over a year ago, I was in Israel with a bunch of my friends. We were all hanging out, there were some 45 of us, standing on the west side of the Jordan, not far from the place where Joshua would have taken over Jericho, not far from the place where Joshua would have crossed across the Jordan. And that day I stood there and I told my friends this story. I, I said to the tour, I said, guys, we must recount the faithfulness of God. I read them this passage and I talked about how God had been so faithful to me. And then I even went around with everybody standing there and I said, share with me some of the ways that God has been faithful to you. And things started coming out about God's faithfulness in marital strife, God's faithfulness with the loss of a child, God's faithfulness in financial ruin. On and on the stories went about the faithfulness of God. And they said, guys, this is what we need to do. We need to each grab a stone. Here on this side of the Jordan, I want you to go and I want you to find a stone. And I want you to place it here as a memorial of God's faithfulness. They scattered amongst the dry desert there in Israel and they grabbed the stones and there together we made this massive mound of stones. Each rock representing a time in our life where God, <clears throat> excuse me, where God had been unbelievably faithful. I know that I could have brought a dump truck into this place today and had each of you grab a stone, two stones, three stones, a wheelbarrow full of stones and you could have come in together, we could have made a mound of stones, recounting the faithfulness of God to us. He has been so faithful. And for us to be faithful to him, we must begin by recounting his faithfulness to us. When we look back at God's faithfulness in our past, we are more ready to trust him in our future. There are moments in my life and leadership, in my marriage or in my parenting, in my friendship or in my sonship, you name it, whatever role I'm in, there are moments where great courage is needed. But that courage doesn't come from mustering it up from the, own, my, the soles of my own feet. My courage to do great things for God comes by understanding that God has already done great things for me, that he is so faithful. And I don't trust in a sword to win a battle. I don't even trust in a trumpet to win a battle. I trust in the faithfulness of God to win a battle. So two chapters before the battle of Jericho, these people stopped to remember that God is faithful. I don't know what God has for us in our future. Today I'll lay out some things that I think he's directing us towards, but I know that before we go on any great conquest to reach Denver for the name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we must first remember the faithfulness of God. So I want to pick up a few of those stones. I want to recount for you some of the ways that God has been extremely faithful in this last year. You were handed one of these reports as you came in today. This is what I call the faithfulness report. It's an annual report. It's what every good nonprofit should put together for you, but we're not just any nonprofit. We're the greatest, most powerful organization on the planet Earth, run by God himself. And this is a report to talk about how God has been faithful. And I'm gonna quote some of the pages in here. I'm gonna direct your eyes to some of the things, but I want us just to celebrate God's faithfulness 
And you're welcome to flip through this as I mentioned some specific pages. Let me, let me tell you a few of the stones, the great things that I saw God do this year. I'm gonna start with the recent history of summer and Vacation Bible School. At Vacation Bible School, we had an incredible showing of 378 kids at our Vacation Bible School that were in here listening to the word of God, splitting into small groups, hearing about the faithfulness of God. We had 25 refugees through our refugee ministry that joined us for that. And get this, we had 53 kids make a decision of faith in Jesus Christ over that Vacation Bible School. Isn't that amazing? That's God's faithfulness. It was an amazing, an amazing thing. We continue to be a place where we watch kids grow in their faith in Jesus Christ, my own kids included. I have them often recounting for me what they learned when they were at church, singing the songs that they learned. Even my two-year-old daughter, she says to me, Dad, my favorite song, it's, it's not quite this articulate, but it's close. My favorite song is Jesus Loves Me. I didn't teach her Jesus Loves Me, but I know that they're singing it even in our nursery ministry here. We're seeing amazing things happen in our kids' ministry. The next thing I want to mention to you is the Hope of Denver opened this year. A year ago, we set out to start the foundations of a biblical counseling center. And God was faithful to bring nine people to our leadership team that are going to help us start this biblical counseling center. We had a ribbon cutting on, in July, on July 25th or 26th. And we cut the ribbon of a small little building down here on the east side of our campus, where now we are open for free biblical counseling to you as a church and also to our community. Now listen, I've started a biblical counseling center before. I was super passionate to start one here at Grace Chapel. But in, even in the one that I started in the past, we didn't have nine people that got through certification with the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. We didn't have that many people on our team to start with. Yet God was faithful to not only call these people to go through a very rigorous certification process, but now to volunteer their time to give free biblical counseling to other people. God is faithful. We now have a, a, a biblical counseling center that is a part of our ministry, and I think it will be one of the most evangelistic things we do in the coming years here at Grace Chapel. That's one of the stones of faithfulness. Another one that I recount is the Guatemala trip. You had the kids up here this summer, uh, the youth that told you about how they saw God's faithfulness as they traveled to Guatemala. You'll remember the service that we did in the spring where I said, open your wallets, any cash that you got, you dump it in the plate. Over $4,000 we raised in cash that day to fund different projects, and they were able to reach youth and senior citizens to help a church that was happening in Guatemala, not that, that, is, that is living on in Guatemala, not to mention what's happening in the lives of our youth, and we're watching their lives be changed. That's a stone of God's faithfulness. How can I not mention our young adults ministry? It's one of the most vibrant young adult ministries in all of South Denver. And every Tuesday night, this campus is abuzz with young adults who are gathering to study God's word and then breaking into small groups, holding each other accountable to walk in faithfulness to Christ. This year, we had an incredible young adult retreat. Steve Whitlock, our young adults pastor, said it was one of the most amazing young adult retreats that we've ever had in Grace Chapel history. A stone of God's faithfulness. Milestones, you can read about this on page 10. Ron, our family and prayer pastor, he talks about the milestones classes that we've started. I, I think he said there was up to 120 people, over 60 homes that were involved in our milestones classes. We said several years ago, that we would partner with parents to help them be the primary discipler of kids in the home. We want to be the secondary discipler, the supporting discipler, but we want parents to be the primary discipler of their children. So we started these milestones classes, these key stepping stones within kids' lives, training parents to be intentional and teach them about the faithfulness of God at home. And we saw many kids be dedicated here on stage, their parents dedicating themselves to raising them in a godly home. And what about our prayer gatherings? Our prayer gatherings were amazing. Over 250 people that came to be a part of our prayer gatherings, which I've told you I think are the most important meetings in our whole church where we gather and we seek the face of God. We sought him here in this worship center, in the upper lobby, down in the gym. We've had all sorts of prayer gatherings, formal prayer gatherings, and I should even say informal prayer gatherings, where people are seeking the face of God like never before. We're becoming more dependent on prayer in every area of our ministry, and I love that, and we can only continue to grow in that, in that area. 
Our men's ministry just continued to be vibrant. This year, we had an incredible men's retreat, over 80 men that attended that. I had the privilege of teaching at that. Relationships were forged. Lives were changed. And then we've seen so many different men be involved in our men's barbecue, which over 100 men have attended uh, those three events in this last year. And our small groups that happen all throughout the week, Tuesday nights and elsewhere. Men doing discipleship together. I love that. Of course, we want to be a church for men, but not just men. We want to reach the women. And we saw all sorts of women join our women's Bible studies. Hundreds of ladies through mops and our Bible studies touched here on our campus. And then obviously lives transformed beyond our campus by the study of God's word and the faithfulness of holding each other together, accountable to what God has done. That's another amazing stone of God's faithfulness. I have to mention our volunteer worship team. They're sitting right down here in the front. We have an amazing worship team that gives of their time to come and to volunteer to help lead you in worship every single week. I talked about this in the worship report that you can see there in the, the annual report, where we talked about how these people have come together and formed a leadership team to help us refine our song list and to make sure this is an engaging environment for you to continue to seek the face of God every single week. We're not just about ourselves, though. Man, we've done so much local ministry, our refugee ministry, some of the things that we're doing to help single moms. And then we put a well in in Africa, a well where there was not fresh water, located on a church campus. So people are coming to a church to get living water for their soul, but also to have drinking water and water that they can cook with and survive with there in Africa. That was a project that you helped fund, that God was faithful to do in our midst. And then I have to mention this one. It was a big milestone for our church. This last year, we became debt-free. We paid off our mortgage, and we have no debt as a church. That's pretty unheard of as a church, but thank you for, good, for God's faithfulness. Listen, God has been so extremely faithful. And one of the agonizing things for me this week was just to think about what were the few stones that I could mention, because there are so many stones of faithfulness that I could mention. But God has been so faithful. Last year, I'll end this first part with this. Last year, we set out to do three things. To look forward, which means that we would start thinking about how we could have greater and better impact in the days ahead. To link arms by having a better connection with new people that are coming to this place and also starting more small groups. And by making sure that we were living intentionally to reach more people through our outreach. So loving locally and globally those who desperately need Jesus. And I'm happy to report that God has been faithful and so many things that we set out to do in this last year have been done. Because why? Not because we were faithful although that was a part of it, but first, God was faithful. Our faithfulness was a response to his faithfulness to us. Being faithful means that we're full of faith to trust that God has a plan better than our own, and we watched that live out this year. So can we just praise the Lord for his faithfulness and these stones of remembrance? In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and let's just say this together in an affirmation to the Lord. Yahweh, God is faithful. God is faithful. Say it with me. Ready? One, two, three. God is faithful. One more time. God is faithful. Come on. Come on. And worship to him. God is faithful. Heavenly Father, we realize that you have been so faithful. And there is so much to celebrate, Father, through what you have done in our midst in this year. And Father, may we be people who are quick to remember your faithfulness. May we be people who are quick to remember that if it wasn't for you doing a mighty work, we would have no reason to respond in obedience and faithfulness to you. So thank you for what you have done. You are our Lord. You are our Yahweh, our Redeemer, our great I Am. We praise you, Father, for what you have done in our midst. Great is your name. You are faithful. We love you, Father, in your name. Amen. Let's sing this as an anthem together. God is so faithful, and he is our great I am. And one of the things I love about that song is it has become our anthem as a church. We have loved that song. And last year, we kind of kicked it off around our Vision Sunday, talking about God breathing into these dry bones. And not that our church was dried up, and it was a has-been church, but it was a church that desperately needed the breath of the Holy Spirit, as any church does. And we've seen God do that in an incredible way. 
So if the last section of my sharing with you was remembering God's faithfulness, then this next section is embracing God's vision, embracing God's vision. And I want to take just a few moments to talk about what it means for us to embrace God's vision in this next year. There's a passage that's been laid on my heart to kind of drive us as we go forward. And it's a passage that we looked at last week and we will look more at in the next couple weeks. But it's found in 2 Corinthians. It's found on page 966 and it's verses 17 through 20 of chapter five. Now I had made a, a request that you guys would memorize 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Did anybody memorize that this week? Anybody have that down cold? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Come on, somebody. Nobody? There's a prize. There's a prize. There's a prize. And there will be a prize next week, I guess. So let's try it, okay, please. Let's just read it together. Look at verse 17 of chapter 5. Really, nobody? I really want to give a prize away. Nobody has this cold? Somebody? Did I miss somebody? Oh, well, okay. We got somebody. Okay, great. I'm ready. Can you, would you mind standing up and repeating it for us? I know you get a gold star on your Sunday school attendance sheet for this, but go for it. Go for it. That's awesome. Yes. She's got it. And Joey has a, a we have these new cool Grace Chapel mugs. So Joey's going to give you a, one of our mugs here for that. Anybody else want a Grace Chapel mug? Anybody ever, else this past? Oh, I see somebody over here. Okay. Go for it, stand up, and just say it real loud for us. We're all looking at our passage to make sure you have it, so just kidding. Do you want to? No? You got it? Kim, you got it? <laughs> it doesn't start with that, for sure. <laughs> That's all right. Yes, behold, the old has gone and the new has come. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. This is an amazing passage, and I would love for us all to commit it to our memory. It's, it, it talks about really this new life in Christ that we have only through Christ, that the old is gone and the new has come. How many want the old gone in their life? Anybody want the old gone? And it should be like all of us, right? We want the old gone and we want the new here, and the new is found in Christ. Let's look at how this passage continues. Verse 18, it says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, Paul's obviously talking about himself and what he has done, but it should be something that I think we can apply to us as well. We've been called, we've been given a ministry of reconciliation, and I'll expound on that in a moment. But look how he continues. Verse 19, he says, that is, what is the ministry of God? reconciliation? It's this, that Christ God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He takes the power of verse 17 and says, my life has been transformed, I've been made new, and now my whole life is to help other people find what it means to be made into a new creation. He doesn't say I'm called to be an evangelist. He doesn't say I'm called to be a pastor. He doesn't say I'm called to be a church planter or a shepherd, though he did all of those things. But he said, I'm called to the ministry of reconciliation. I'm called to reconcile people to God. Now, I submit to you this morning that this is the ministry of the church. And I'll even go further and say the ministry of reconciliation is the ministry or the mission of every Christian. Every single one of us is called to a ministry of reconciliation. How many of us are called to a ministry of reconciliation? All of us, every one of us. This isn't just Paul's job, but it's all of our job. Now, why reconciliation? Why would we call, why, why all this talk about reconciliation? Well, if you think about it, reconciliation, by its very definition, is to take two people who are opposed to one another and to bring them together. And we were counted as enemies against God and have been welcomed in by the power of Christ, by Christ Jesus' work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. We have been welcomed in to be friends of God. This is the significant saving act of Christ, that he reconciles us unto God. It's a ministry of reconciliation. 
We're reconciled to God, our creator, which therefore gives us life. So the gospel ministry of reconciliation for for all of us, I think, has two parts. First, it starts with it's personally experienced. I personally have experienced what it means to be made a new creation. But the second part is that it's authentically shared that I go into the world and authentically, not forcefully, not manipulatively, but with all the passion that is in me because I've been transformed, I authentically share with a world that desperately needs to be reconciled with God. So last week I laid out what our new mission statement will be for Grace Chapel and I wanna share with you again, it is leading people to find and follow Jesus. That's what we're about. People say, why does your church exist? We exist for the ministry of reconciliation. But that's a clunky mission statement. So we put it this way. We are leading to people to find and follow Jesus. That's what we do. It is that simple. We exist to help people find, and not just find Jesus and go, okay, I found him. I know that he's the savior, but actually following him, obeying all the commandments that he laid out for us. And we believe that by leading people to find and follow Jesus, we will be people who are experiencing abundant life in Christ together. Our vision statement for the church is to be people who are experiencing abundant life in Christ together by living out the great commandment, which is to love God and love others and fulfilling the great commission. That's what we're setting out to do. So in the next 12 to 18 months, I have four things that have really been placed on my heart that I think we need to lean into. And these aren't just me alone. These are with the elders and the staff. We've prayed about these. We've talked about these actually for months and dating back to February. We've been in long day, all day sessions working on these things. There are four areas we as a church need to lean into heavily in the next 12 to 18 months to fulfill our mission. Now, let me say this before I unveil them. These build on last year's vision imperatives. We talked about linking arms, looking forward, loving intently. Those were things we were gonna do last year, things that we are still doing. And these, like any good vision, these things I'm about to share with you build on top of what has happened over the last year. Did we arrive or accomplish everything we set out to last year? No, not everything. But a good vision is constantly calling us to take the next peak for Christ. So we stand on this mountain range and we look down and we go, let's take that peak. Here's the next peak I think we need to take. Number one is we need to have an exceptional weekend experience. This isn't just about programming. It's about an opportunity for you to encounter the supremacy of Christ and to express your gratefulness to God for just how wonderful he is. And so in this next year, we're going to continue to work hard on making sure that our church has an exceptional weekend experience. We want this to be a place where people long to come. I refer to it as a third space. You have your home, you have your work, and you have your church. I want this to be your third space. I want this to be a place that your kids say, I can't wait to get back there. And I want it to be a place that you say, I can't wait to get back there because I get so refreshed by the environment, by the people that are there, and by the movement of God that happens in that place. We want the whole campus, from curb to seat, to be transformed. We're hoping that this place will continue to increase in how we are hospitable to other people. I'm gonna ask you to please pray with me that we see 20% growth in our church over the next few years. If that happens in the next 12 months, that'd be amazing, but we're gonna plan and pray for 20% growth as a church. Why? Because Some 89% of Douglas County is unchurched. They need a church. I want them to come and have the living water of Jesus Christ and hear it from our mouths in an authentic and genuine way. So we're gonna pray for that, but we need your help. Hospitality is something that all of us should be a part of. So let's be hospitable to those who come. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what has happened. We have seen a three or 4% growth in this last year in our church, which is exciting. But we've seen a whole lot more than that. We estimate it could be as high as 800 people who have come into this place and visited. But we haven't grown by 800 people. So our hope is that we will steward those who come in. This isn't just an attractional thing. Let's reach more people that aren't being reached. Yes, of course we want that, but let's be hospitable to those who come. And that's something we need everybody to help us with. While we're only seeing three to 4% in growth in attendance, we're seeing unbelievable growth in our financial giving. Some 14% in our financial giving. We continue to grow year over year. That's amazing. God's entrusting us with the means to be able to reach more people locally and globally, but we need to be hospitable to those who come in this door. And another challenge that I wanna give you this morning is 
I wanna ask that you please, in this next year, you try to make church attendance something that is of great priority. Uh, The average church attendance in South Denver, people only go to church 1.6 Sundays a month. That's kind of the average statistic of South Denver. And I was hoping that it was different for Grace Chapel. And then we did some research by looking at different attendance charts and things. We found that the average people at Grace Chapel come 1.7 times a month at Grace Chapel. Now I get it. When it snows outside, you wanna be outside. When it's sunny outside, you want to be outside. This is a state where we want to be outside. But I'm saying, please, for 70 minutes or even up to three or four hours of your Sunday, if you come for both services to serve or Sunday school, please make church attendance a priority. And being very specific, I would love to see you come to this place at least three times a month to worship with us. Please make that a priority. And men, lead your families in such a way that they can come and be here. Make church a priority. I see the day that we will all love to be here and love this place, and we'll have to start telling people, come on, we got to close. It's nighttime. Keep moving. Next thing, next thing that we're going to be looking for in this year is life event care and discipleship. We want to focus in on how we can make sure people are cared for in the transition parts of their life. Part of this comes through the launch of the Hope of Denver ministry making sure that there's joy found in the midst of suffering for people, but also making sure that we have intentional groups that are getting people together. Maybe they're for specific purposes like a cancer support group or grief share or divorce care or just groups where discipleship can happen. But we're gonna put a, a disproportionate amount of effort into life event care, so things that happen in our life, making sure we're ready to care for you in those places, and discipleship, growing our group's ministry and making sure that we're discipling people. I see the day when the Grace Chapel ministry and the Hope of Denver is a first response for people. It's not a last resort. I don't want our church to be a last resort. Something bad happens in your life, I want you, after you call 911 if you need to do that, call our church, right, and say, I need someone. I want a body around me that will support me, right? We want to be here for the hard points in life and also the celebratory parts of your life. The third thing that we're going to put disproportionate effort towards is growing leaders and connecting people, growing leaders and connecting people. For a long time, maybe even since the very beginning of Grace Chapel, we have put a high emphasis on being a staff-led church, and it's time for that to change. While we have a great staff, I want more leaders rising up in volunteer positions throughout our church. Our worship team's a prime example of that. They've stood up and said, we'll lead you guys forward. And, and I love, and we, we gotta see that in more areas. So we wanna see volunteerism continue to rise. Not that the staff does it for you, but that we together as a body work out the mission that God has for us. Part of this is local and global, happening here in our body, but also happening overseas. We wanna see more people involved in our missions ministry and our outreach ministry. We're launching something that you're gonna hear about in the month of September called Unleashed Ministries, where we're literally letting the ministries come from you and the body. You tell us what you're passionate about. Go start something and be entrepreneurial for the kingdom and Grace Chapel will support you and send you off to reach more people locally or globally. I see the day when groups, Sunday school classes, our missions ministry isn't just a part of our ministry, but it's the whole of our ministry being led by the people of Grace Chapel. I see the day when we can't help but say, we have so much going on and so much that's been unleashed for the kingdom that we got to just stand and thank the Lord for his faithfulness because of what he's doing over here and over here and over here and over here. I see the day. Finally, we're going to put a lot of impact, disproportionate effort towards reaching people for Jesus. We want to lead people to find Jesus. We are going to be extremely salvation focused in this next year. Not that we haven't been before, but it's time for us to rise up as disciples of Christ and realize that part of discipleship is also evangelism. And so we're gonna continue to make sure that we're inviting people to come and to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I've seen it happen before in my past ministry at churches that when a church gets serious about reaching lost people, God brings lost people. So we're gonna get serious about reaching people that don't know Jesus Christ. We're going to be diligent to share the gospel from this stage and in every environment across our campus all the time, hopefully in small groups that are meeting in homes. And I'm praying for, you want to know what I'm praying for? I'm praying for up to 100 salvations in the next three years. We we saw over 50 some odd salvations just this, this year. I don't see why we couldn't see 100 plus salvations every year. 
I would love to see 50 some odd baptisms every year. We had 24 today. We're going to baptize a whole bunch more after our second service today. But I want to continually see people transformed, like verse 17 says in our passage, transformed and made new in Christ. But listen, that means that you have to be a part of it that you have to see the ministry of reconciliation and the ministry of Grace Chapel as your ministry, not what we do, but what we, all of us do, not what the staff does, but what the church does. We must continue to be ambassadors for Christ. My challenge to you is that you find one person this year that you're gonna be faithful to share the gospel with. I want you to find one life, one life that you're gonna dump yourself into and your energy into and your prayer into, to help that person come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, if we, every single one of us, just picked one person that we're gonna be intentional to share the gospel with this year, we will see over six or 700 salvations in the next couple years because I believe God is faithful to call people unto himself, but he might be waiting for you to be obedient as the tool to call that person unto himself. So find your one life and please be an ambassador for Christ. I want us to close by reading verse 20 together of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to put it on the screen. You don't have to flip back open to it. But here's the the verse. And this is a verse that I hope drives us as we go into this next year. We have all sorts of things that are going to happen across this property, great things that will happen in our programs. But listen, if we aren't doing what God has called us to do by fulfilling the ministry of reconciliation, it doesn't matter what happens with our property. It doesn't matter what happens with our programs. It's all about the individual people living on mission for God. And this is our mission. I'll read it out loud, then we're going to read it together. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Think about how powerful that is. Like an ambassador that goes to a foreign country, maybe even an opposing country, trying to make peace and reconcile, so also we are being sent into a world that does not love Christ, but desperately needs Christ. He's sending you as an ambassador to make his appeal through you to a world that desperately needs him. Let's read this together. Ready? We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Friends, I believe God is going to do great and mighty things in this next year. And I wish I had more. I've written documents on this of all the specific things we're going to do in this next year. Our staff spend time every Monday talking about these specific things, what we're going to do. But I'm I'm just saying, we can't wait to see God move. But we can't do it for you. We need to do it with you and all together. So let's be ambassadors for God and see him move in a great and mighty way. One last thing I just want to mention, because we've changed our mission, we've kind of changed our tagline, which means it was time to change our logo and give it a fresh coat of paint. So we have a new logo, a new branding that's going out. And the reason that that's important is just to say to the outside world, hey, listen, we're a new place, renewed and ready to reach South Denver for Jesus. Are you on that mission with me? We're going to reach South Denver for Jesus? I was sitting with another pastor at my table yesterday morning. We had breakfast together at our home. And he said, I can't wait to see what God's going to do through Grace Chapel. And I got chills sitting there at the table thinking, he's going he's to reach the city through this church, if we will remain faithful because he has been so faithful to us. So we will lead people to find and follow Jesus. Will you stand to your feet? And I want us to close by grasping the hand of people in our aisles. And I even want you to go across the aisles, okay? Grab the hands of someone, maybe even across the aisle from you. And this is just a sign to say, we're in this together. Let's hold hands with somebody even across the aisles. That's great. That's great. Look around for a second. Look at this church. This is your church, right? These are your nine o'clock people mostly. I mean, you guys, you guys come, you see each other, get to know each other. We're in this together. Don't be unfamiliar with those who are ambassadors of Christ with you. All right, let's lead people to find and follow Jesus together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we dedicate ourselves to you. You see us grasping hands and grasping hearts. You see us linking together to accomplish your great work. Father, I know, I know that you make people new because you've made me new. I've experienced it. And so God, I pray that you will help us be people who know of your faithfulness and can't help but go into this city and proclaim your faithfulness to a world that desperately needs you. We love you. We trust you with these vision things. We know you've given them. We believe that, Lord. They've been affirmed and prayed over. But now it's time for us to have faith and obedience. So strengthen us and help us obey your commands. We love you. In the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen.